In our neck of the woods, we are knee-deep in the tropical moisture. There it is on the satellite. I do notice that the easterly flow has shut down just a little bit. If you look at the cloud movements, they are kind of indeterminate. You can kind of see a very weak, maybe eastward drift. And that contrasts quite a bit from that strong easterly flow we had just a couple of days ago. And there's how we're looking on the 700 millibar analysis. High pressure right there. This is in the mid-levels of the troposphere, about 10,000 feet high. And that vaguely connects back into this extension of the Bermuda High out to the east. We can see a call, C-O-L, right in between these two highs. That's kind of like a saddle point. You've got low pressure down here, low pressure up to the north. So that's between these lows and between these highs. And in the middle right there, the flow is indeterminate. If we look at Alabama, check out the sounding, you can see the flow is pretty much dead. And out over Texas, with that high getting reestablished, the temperatures are coming up just a little bit. And the flow, likewise very light and variable, however abundant moisture, all the way up to the upper troposphere. The weather picture this afternoon is much less extreme than what we had earlier this week. Have a well-developed polar system, polar front moving through the central Mississippi River Valley, cold front extending into Oklahoma and into the plains of Colorado. And it also extends eastward, hooking back into this low pressure system near Long Island. Temperatures have come down significantly at Boston, down to 76 from the upper 90s yesterday and cool air filtering back in behind across the Great Lakes. I am kind of hard pressed to find records now. We do have to bring that north a little bit. Uh, Glasgow, 98, they have to hit 101 to break the record for the date, and 96 at Great Falls, and their record is 99. So don't see any records at this moment, but we still have a few hours to go for heating today. And the Arizona monsoon in full force. We got 58 there at Nogales, 59 at Safford, 56 at Phoenix. And we need 55 to have a monsoon. Technically, it's over a span of about three days. But uh, yeah, we're certainly in that ballpark 59 along the Colorado River. And it looks like Las Vegas has dried out with a dew point of 39 there. We are not done with that heat wave. That heat has actually moved into the Canadian prairies and into Manitoba. Yesterday, we had records being broken in northern Saskatchewan, northern Alberta, and the Northwest Territories. We had hundreds up in that region. Looks like a repeat today. We've got uh, 100 right there. I'm not sure if that's Uranium City, somewhere in that region. Uh, Stony Plains, I think. And 100 at Fort McMurray. And even up at Churchill, the polar bear capital, 88 degrees at this hour. That's not a record, actually. The record for July is 93, and for August, it's 98, and that's the actual all-time record. And just before this observation, they had 91 degrees. A little stationary front from Great Slave Lake over to the Brooks Range. Some cooler temperatures off the screen there. Uh, 30s and 40s on the north slope, way up there. However, the temperatures are coming up in Alaska, 73 there at Fairbanks. They're expecting 87 later this afternoon, and one little spot of 90 degrees expected around Eagle, Alaska, and that's going to be probably the hot spot in the state for today. Let's take a look what's going on in British Columbia. We had Lytton with 121 located about right here, now, obviously, that was a couple days ago. It's cooled down considerably since then. Some of that marine air has worked into the mountain ranges through the passes, and temperatures have come down to 88. And also, the large upper-level high has pushed off towards the east. So a couple of factors there. That and the reduced easterly flow, all of that is cooling things down. But we've still got 88 there at Kamloops and 93 at 
whatever station that is, north of OMAC, a little bit of heat still in that region. Yeah, there's a smoke icon right there. That tells me there may be forest fires going in that region now. Yeah, I had to run the satellite data all the way back, but it appears that there was a fire at Lytton. This is two days ago when they were up to 121. Let me run this up. Yeah, see that right there? Uh, 120. And you notice that a plume of smoke gets going in that area. So that's going to be Lytton. Yeah, that's Ashcroft. And then we have Kamloops right there. So anyway, yeah, that plume gets going. Tinderbox type situation right there. A little puff of storms probably got going on the mountains there. Some more graphic development. The extreme heat, a little bit of moisture got that thing going. And you can see that hot spot there showing up on infrared. In fact, a couple of them. One near Lytton, another northwest of Kamloops. And we move forward to the next day, yesterday. And we see smoke in the valleys. And a couple of fires going up there off the edge. And temperatures coming up to 100 right there at Lytton. They were starting to get cooler weather. And I can see a 117 right there uh, at Ashcroft. And the satellite data is kind of hosed right there. I guess I get to say hosed since we're looking at Canada. But uh, anyway, yeah, smoke for today. So they've had wildfire problems going on there. And look at that, uh, these anvils picking up. With the upper level high moving off towards the east. And with a low pressure center offshore. That gives us a pressure gradient, and Bayes Ballot's law says that we're going to get southerly flow developing in between. So these storms that we have in the middle, those are sheared. Little bit of storm organization possible. And I guess they're taking advantage of what instability there is in this situation. Yeah, there's where we're at right there. Uh, 99 over 63 in that area, 99.52. So. That's about what we would see in Colorado during the summertime. So some of that going on there. Monsoon season continuing in the southwestern U.S. And looks like we've got convection over most of the southeast part of Arizona, moving into the mountains east of Tucson. So it should be encroaching on the city shortly. Phoenix still looking a little bit clear, but we could always see something coming off the mountains to the east or to the north. And up to the top right of the screen, an outflow boundary. There it is right there in the northern Texas Panhandle around, uh, that'd be about Canadian up to Perryton and up through Boise City to Clayton. And you can see that wind shift right there at Clayton. And there's what it looks like on the surface chart. Boundary is going to be running about like that there. Some very cool conditions north of that boundary. And in the warm sector, don't see any evidence of a dry line. Pretty much 60s and 50s all the way into New Mexico. So storms are forming wherever there's access to deep and rich enough moisture. A very beautiful satellite image for the southeastern U.S. this afternoon. It does look like that easterly flow has abated somewhat, and you can kind of see where that call is. Remember, we were talking about that kind of in this area. If you look on either, either side of it, there's northerly flow over here and southerly flow on the other side. And that's kind of evident. So we've really shut down that easterly flow, but still supporting a cluster of storms across Florida. It's like a couple of small line segments all the way up into South Carolina. And then we've got that polar front moving south through Nashville, Memphis, Little Rock, and Oklahoma City. And that's a good time as any to look at what the Storm Prediction Center has. Nothing of interest for these, this cluster. They are widespread thunderstorm cells, but it looks like not a whole lot of support for severe weather. The exception... Some severe watches in effect from New Jersey down through Maryland into Virginia. We can probably take a closer look at that using the radar. 
Yeah, radar, what a handy tool this is. MCS, extending from at least the New York City area up at the top, down through, yeah, down through New Jersey. Looks like it's cleared all of Delaware, but it's still moving through the Delmarva, and looks like it has yet to impinge on Norfolk. The New York City radar indicating that that pretty much is the north end of that line. So it starts out just south of Newark. Just some, looks like mostly elevated, unorganized cells through Massachusetts and Connecticut. And I probably would pretty much expect that since, as I recall, the frontal boundary is well down to the south. So likely some dry air interacting with those cells up to the north. There's a quick look at the surface chart showing that the air mass is certainly quite cool in Massachusetts, so the front is well to the south. It may uh, have not quite passed through some of these areas. Um, Block Island, Cape Cod, they're still running almost 80 degrees in that region, so the front probably running about through this area here. And also, I noticed that the dew points are still a little bit on the high side in places like Philadelphia, 69, 83 over 69, 82 over 70 there at Trenton. Is that Trenton? I don't know. You tell me. And it looks like we only get into the dry air once we get up into northern Pennsylvania and western New York. So quite possibly, the front may actually be running through this area right here with the line of storms out ahead of it. So that surface map that we did could require a little bit of refinement. The Northern Plains and the Great Lakes, well, not much to say here. looks like a very nice day. Northerly flow, cold air advection, so I'm expecting some cool conditions in Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis. But it looks like a little cluster of storms out around Toledo and Cleveland. I have to move the map to show that. Yeah, and it looks like they're developing along that little sea breeze coming off the lake. The western periphery of that sea breeze looks like it's a nucleus for cell generation there around Toledo. And there's how conditions are looking at the sour. Not so cold at Minneapolis. They're, they've got 86 there. But the flow off the lake, 75 at Chicago. We've got 77 at Detroit. So not a super cold air mass, but certainly some welcome relief in those dew points in the 40s and 50s probably feel pretty good. And that brings us back to the Pacific Northwest. Looks uh, quite a bit cooler. I don't see any 100s in Washington or Oregon at this hour. 100 at Haver, Montana. They need 102 to break the record for the date. And we've already gone over Canada, just looking up there for a quick update. Yep, 100 at Stony Plains, Stony Rapids. Coming up to 88 there at Churchill with a northwest wind. And then checking up in Alaska. 79 at Eagle, temperatures coming up. And that's that station that was expecting 90 later today. And that makes up our extended detailed analysis. So now we are very well grounded in what we need to understand the forecast maps. So everything here should make sense. That's that polar high right there. It's certainly infecting some warm air up into Manitoba, but on the other side, some very cool air. And this makes this a classic bear clinic high. And of course, the frontal boundary down to the south right there so let's run this forward and see how things are looking for the 4th of July weekend. We know that there's plenty of moisture down south. That boundary will push south and interact with that air mass. So we should see lots of storm activity in the southern states all the way from North Carolina through Atlanta out to Dallas for tomorrow. And then by Saturday, that boundary should be down in the Gulf Coast region, affecting mostly Jacksonville, New Orleans, Houston, and possibly up towards Midland, Texas. So there's how things are looking for the third, very dry. And then going forward into the fourth, that's the map for the evening. 
Looks like a very mild, very nice pattern across much of the southeast U.S., not counting the Gulf Coast where there should be some storms. And we've got this southerly flow starting to get established in the Caprock area, West Texas. You can see that on the skew T right there. Southerly flow at 10 knots and 40 knots aloft. So some of the storms will be a bit sheared and that will help them organize somewhat during the evening. And yeah, there they are right there. And going forward into the upcoming week, any big changes? Another burst of cold air coming out of the Canadian prairies, affecting mostly the northern states. And oh yeah, I forgot to mention Tropical Storm, Elsa. That's it right there, 40 knots. Let's pull up the movement on that. There we go. So it looks like they're expecting that to remain a tropical storm, but that track will take it up through Cuba and possibly into western Florida by next Tuesday. So that right there is where the GFS has it on Tuesday afternoon. The European model, on the other hand, not picking that up fact it doesn't show up at all let me go back and see if it's tracking that into the gulf no nope, nothing either so i guess we're going mostly off of the gfs indications so we'll check that out as we get into next week anyway i think that'll do it looking at the clock on the wall we've got to get this wrapped up I want to thank our new patron, RT. Thank you for the generous donation. It really helps keep this program going and that support is good for my morale. It is very difficult to keep up with all the book projects, the programming, and this, which takes a few hours every day. So your support definitely helps keep that going. Okay, and that'll do it for our Thursday edition. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.